doing this with Gulf International Forum, a leading think tank in Washington, D.C. that focuses on issues in and around the Gulf. Uh, and we're very happy to be able to do this with uh, Dania Toffer, who's the uh, executive director of Gulf International Forum. She's going to lead the conversation today. I'll just start with a couple of quick logistical issues. For those of you who are in the room, uh, after the panel presentation, you'll be able to ask questions just by raising your hand and your voice. Uh, for those of you who are watching us online, if you are interested in asking a question, please just use the Q&A function. I'll be seated in the first row, and I'll be able to read your questions aloud for the panel. So with that, let's uh, welcome our friends from Gulf International Forum. We look forward to your conversation. Thank you. Um, as he mentioned, uh, I'm Daniel Offer, the Executive Director at Gulf International Forum. And on behalf of the forum, um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, John Chorciari and Susanna Wisely um, with your university for co-sponsoring this event with us. I hope you find it um, intellectually uh, stimulating. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to have you all here and join us or rejoin you um, for a panel discussion uh, titled From Conflict to Dialogue, the Shifting Relationship Between the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and Iran. Um, we have an excellent panel lined up for you today um, with four speakers with very diverse backgrounds. Um, in the Gulf region, uh, the states are realizing um, that the marginal gains of conflict is diminishing and have moved more towards de-escalation. And the calculus uh, has changed as we have witnessed uh, three major events in the region. The first is the Al Ula Agreement, which uh, brought de-escalation within the GCC states. Um, and the blockade that was there previously really has tipped the balance um, within the GCC towards having more de-escalation with Iran. Um, which um, three of the states have uh, cautiously uh, amicable relations with the country, um, which is different than we've seen in the previous years. President, uh, by, uh, uh, um, uh, President Trump's uh, departure from the White House was also a big factor. Um, as many of you might be aware that uh, President Trump had a very pro um, Saudi Arabia kind of view uh, with the Gulf region. And that also has kind of changed um, the incentive structure for dialogue in the region. And of course, as everyone is aware, um, COVID has caused economic havoc, havoc for not only nations in the Gulf region, but worldwide. Um, and so states are focusing more inward and have less incentive for conflict in the region. Um, so at this point, we have uh, the, the Saudis and Iranians um, involved in uh, direct talks um, in Baghdad. And as for the JCPOA, um, although it's six round of talks ended in uh, June of this year, there will be a resumption of talks about the JCPOA between Iran, the US and other major countries um, at the end of this month, actually around Thanksgiving. Um, and there have been reports about um, uh, the resumption of diplomatic relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, we've seen many reports with cautious optimism. We've seen scholars actually have cautious pessimism, I guess, if you will. Um, and I think we'll have a diverse set of views here to present to you about what will be the outcome of these discussions. And in light of uh, these issues, uh, we will we'll, we'll ask uh, key questions to our panelists. Will the US and Iran find a common ground on the JCPOA? If so, how? How can we expect, uh, what, can, what can we expect? Um, of the Saudi-Iranian uh, de-escalation efforts? And how do uh, uh, domestic politics in, in Saudi Arabia and the US and Iran play a role or not play a role in making a deal? Without further, further ado, 
Um, I'll go ahead and commence the panel. Each speaker will speak about eight to 10 minutes, and then we'll go into the Q&A. So please prepare your, your questions. Um, and um, I will introduce each speaker as it's their turn to speak. And we're gonna begin with Ambassador John Limbert. Ambassador John Limbert is a retired foreign service officer and academic. He is a retired professor of Middle East studies at the US Navy Naval Academy. During a 34 year diplomatic career, he served mostly in the Middle East and Islamic Af uh, Africa, including two tours in Iraq, was ambassador to the Islamic Republic of Mauritania and served as a deputy assistant secretary of state responsible for Iranian affairs. Beginning in 1964, he worked in Iran as a university and high school teacher and he notes that that was the hardest part of his career. <laughs> um, Not the university, the high school. <laughs> the university was a piece of cake. <laughs> and later served at the US Embassy in Tehran, where he was held hostage in 1979 to 1981. He has authored numerous books and articles on the Middle East. Um, Ambassador Limbert, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm going to stand to speak, uh, uh, stand to speak if that's okay and thank uh thank you donia and thank uh let me join you in thanking uh, our hosts um from the ford center and from the diplomacy center and from the diplomacy center uh just a personal note um i do not like the islamic republic of iran uh it's not this is in the interest of full disclosure uh, it's not a place I would choose to live. It's not a, a system I would like to live under. Um, and I would like to see our Iranian friends and some of my Iranian family uh, live under something that a system that treats them better. Uh, doesn't throw in, uh, doesn't put uh, uh, dissidents, journalists, blo uh, uh, bloggers, filmmakers, uh, human lawyers, women activists, and others doesn't put them in, uh, in, in jail uh, for expressing their opinion. That's, that's my opinion. But also, uh, for the last 40 some years, I have advocated for a different relationship with the Islamic, between the US and the Islamic Republic, one that um, would I, how can I say, better serve our in uh, better serve um, our interests than the current and old policy traditional policy of yelling insulting and threatening each other uh, that i would say that policy has earned us has earned me no particular friends uh, among americans i'm often called the manchurian candidate I was brainwashed as a, I was supposedly brainwashed as a, as a prisoner. Uh, my Iranian friends, some of them <laughs> use a more direct word. I won't translate it, but it, <laughs> it ends with a suffix kesh. And so I think maybe you people know what that means, uh, <laughs> may understand what that means. Um, I had the honor of serving, uh, of serving uh, the United States in both Iran and Saudi Arabia. In the late 70s, in, in, in the late 70s. And of course, much of our policy, much of what we did in Saudi Arabia um, was arms sales. That's what, that's what we were about. And if we were going to sell uh, expensive weapons to Saudi Arabia, and if we were going to make money for US arms exporters and create well-paying jobs. Uh, contract jobs for uh, re uh, for retired American milita uh, military military. Uh, we had we had to do one thing. We had to make the Saudis scared of someone. Because if you're scared of someone, you buy weapons. And in 1978 79, we wanted them to be scared of the Soviet Union. And the CIA in those days told us that the Soviet Union was running out of oil and would be very soon looking to seize new supplies, uh, new sources of supply from you know where. 
Um, we also we also convinced the Saudis, um, or the Saudis became convinced. I don't know how much we needed to do it, but uh, thanks to some clever map making, that they were uh, surrounded and threatened by Marxist and Marxist leaning countries such as um, Ethiopia, South Ye South Yemen, uh, Iraq, Syria, and so forth, uh, and so forth. Now. That was 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago. Today, uh, not much has changed. Uh, we, the same people who are selling, uh, uh, selling, selling arms need to convince the Saudis that, that today Iran is the great threat. Not the Soviet Union, but Iran. Um, Iran, so they can sell their weapons, uh, they can sell those same weapons that require endless Technical, uh, technical support and spare parts from American contractors. Uh, in this view, they have made the Iranians a quote, malign presence. It's a favorite word, beloved of the, beloved of the American military. Um, and uh, exploit uh, uh, Saudi anti-Shia and anti-Persian sentiment. <clears throat> Of course, the Iranians have not helped their own cause. Uh, for example, they, the, the attacks uh, in Mecca back in the 1980s, the riots in Mecca back in 1980, uh, and the attacks on Saudi diplomatic uh, establishments in Tehran and other Iranian cities. Now, here's my question for you. Um, as Americans, we should ask ourselves, does fostering this enmity between Saudi Arabia and Iran, does it serve our interest? What interest is served by our doing, uh, doing that? What interest was served, for example, by Saudi intervention uh, with US made weapons in Yemen? Seems a reasonable question. Uh, and looking at Iran and the US, here's another question for you. Uh, what has been accomplished by that 40 years of shouting, threatening, and insulting between us and the Iranians? Well, I would put it to you, not a lot. Uh, we've been on a, we're on a, we've been on a, 40 years ago, we got on a road to nowhere. I was part of that, building that road, I guess, uh, in Tehran, uh, and we're still there. And so far, attempts to get off that road uh, to change things have been frustrated on both sides, really, by domestic politics, distrust, suspicion, and just plain bad luck. Now, I look forward to hearing your ideas. I used to ask my students when I was taught at the Naval Academy, that was their final exam question was, uh, why are relations so bad? Why have they been so bad, relations with Iran and the US been so bad for so long? And how do you fix it? And they came, would come to me, this was it's like an open book, question and they come that was the final exam and they'd come to me and they'd say uh, af afterwards they say professor what's the answer i said damned if i know <laughs> uh, but they came up with some pretty good stuff they can't uh, uh, some pretty good stuff so one final point and i leave you with this and then i look forward to the discussion what happens what happens when two parties don't talk to each other for a long time what's the result in the each sees the other as both simultaneously superhuman and subhuman. The superhuman is capable of doing anything, building a nuclear bomb tomorrow, overturning a regime with the push of a button, and um, undermining a system, doing all sorts of doing all sorts of things. Uh, and the superhuman you fear. The subhuman is constrained by no moral considerations. Not only are they capable of doing anything, they will do anything. So the superhuman you fear, the subhuman you despise. And there, as I'm afraid, in a nutshell, is where we have been for the past 40 years with the, uh, we, where we in the Iranians have been for the past 40 years. And uh, we risk, a continuation of that situation because this view will justify the most extreme measures against 
the other side, if that other side is both superhuman and subhuman. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to hearing your ideas in the discussion and hearing your ideas for the answer to my final exam question. Thank you. Thank you uh, for those uh, remarks. Um, we're moving uh, forward with uh, our next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Hisham al Ghanam. Uh, Dr. Hisham al Ghanam is a senior advisor and program director of the International Studies Program with the Gulf Research Center, Cambridge, and a Saudi political scientist. He is a former Fulbright Fellow at the Monterey Institute of International Studies, where he received his master's degree in international policy studies. He also holds a, a PhD from the University of Exeter. He worked at uh, major research centers in the Middle East on issues such as conducting fieldwork in conflict zones, ballistic missiles, the political economy of the GCC, social movements, the Arab upheavals, political slam, and many more issues. Dr. Al Ghanam is a regular speaker at international media outlets, think tanks, and research centers. He authored and contributed to various research studies projects on the GCC and the Arab world. Um, and today he will be addressing whether um, conflict resolution is possible between Saudi and Iran. And um, he will also discuss uh, the possible confidence uh, building measures uh, between the two parties. Uh, welcome, Dr. Hannam. Oh, um, thank you for having me. Very glad to be here. This is a mic, yeah, I assume, because my voice is very low. So I will, uh, I promise I will try to abide by my uh, time limit. And I will start from where uh, uh, the ambassador ended. And I agree that all uh, parties in the region, uh, not only the Saudi and uh, Iranians need to talk to each other. And, ha and I have to say that I see myself uh, uh, as a believer in conflict resolution between the kingdom and Iran and an advocate also for dialogue between the two uh, states. Um, launching a common ground between the two states, I think is important and crucial. And I'm not neutral uh, on this subject. I always been a firm supporter of collective security arrangement. That includes uh, uh, the Gulf and Iran, despite uh, the current uh, security conditions um, we have in the region right now. I always thought that there, um, there were many signs to be optimistic, cautiously optimistic, uh, about the future of the conflict between the two uh, uh, main powers of the region. Uh, it was a hope at many times that these states yeah, will be able to manage the contradictions and expectations among them in a peaceful and a constructive way. Um, so it's uh, starting with this positive note. Um, yeah, currently, Saudi and Iran, I think, um, uh, uh, believe that they need to seriously de-escalate. And this wasn't the case in the past. In the near past, I'm, I'm saying, this is a qualitative difference than what we had before. And after all, uh, competition is fine. It's expected and natural for uh, two hegemons in the region, the kingdom and Iran, that they will compete in their sphere of influence. Uh, but pragmatism should prevail at the end and uh, both states should find a way to deal with each other. Add to this uh, uh, bright picture, uh, the withdrawal or uh, the perception of uh, the withdrawal of the US from the region. These signs were increasing and many states in the region were following a more a pragmatic line. They were seeking to take their fa fate into their own hands, which may uh, be, uh, I think many thought that this would eventu eventually translate in a more peaceful region and uh, a much quieter Gulf, especially that these changes also produced a more moderate rhetoric, rhetoric between many states of the region, actually most of the states of the region with the exception of maybe uh, one, a single state. Um, and on, on a personal level, um, I was engaged in several track two sessions uh, during the last few years. So uh, this, uh, these um, sessions included both academics from Iran and the kingdom uh, and from the Gulf. And these, been, uh, and these sessions I have to say were very beneficial. Uh, 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 and the way that we rarely um, hear the cliches we, uh, we usually uh, uh, hear repeated in the media or many times diplomatic circles, and unfortunately, even within the walls of think tanks. Um, and, and for me, it was really nice to engage in these talks. We avoided exaggerations 
of certain issue or maybe even camouflaging certain issues on, on both sides of the aisle, which, which defies the whole purpose of these meetings. And I think it's always crucial for such uh, back channels, uh, discussions and intellectual gatherings in general uh, to focus on a following a pragmatic approach um, if, we, if we want to find a solution. Um, and there was what I call in academic terms, a buildup of literature and the placement of a discussion in a much needed security framework. Um, because if there is no security and no stability, there will be no function in nation state, no economy, no societies. It's, uh, it's very unfortunate, but it's a political slash security problem and a dilemma that needs a security solution, um, among many other things. Um, and I think that these back channels were also necessary uh, and the debates that we had with our uh, fellow Iranians, it was a necessary step before any, uh, uh, before any um, official engagement. And it's, it also, it produced this alteration of the hostile public uh, rhetoric between the two states to a more moderate one. Uh, this is, I think, a prerequisite for any constructive dialogue in the future. Uh, however, and having said all of these nice, nice things, we also, we also must acknowledge that we have what, uh, what I call major fundamental challenging facing us related to the structure of the region and the regimes itself. This is not the European Union by any means. And it will be difficult to break the current um, stalemate that we have and the region is stuck in. We have serious structural problems and fundamentals that governs the relationship between states in the region, not only Saudi and Iran, which in my view uh, blocks and, and makes any peaceful progress in the region extremely difficult and hard. <laughs> so on one hand, we have the Islamic Republic, a revolutionary regime, not very revolutionary when it comes to uh, certain parts of the region, such as Syria, Lebanon, or Iraq. Actually, it's counter-revolution and, uh, and anti-revolution. But in any case, it's a regime since its existence and since it came to power, declares and seeks um, that one of its main goals is to change the status quo that dominated the region, a status quo uh, supported by Western powers, Americans and Europeans uh, since the creation of the nation state in the region and for decades. And on the other hand, we have these um, conservative monarchies and emirates, maybe not very conservative lately in their foreign policy, which is a good thing. Maybe I will come to this later. But this makes that the perception in the region that hard power will remain the most effective way to shape the region and the foreseeable future. Um, the, the, the conflict in the region was never about trust alone. It, it, it revolves around aggression capabilities and violence that respect no borders and no nation state. Um, this, I think this threat uh, more now than when the nuclear deal was struck in 2015. Um, the Saudis and the GCC uh, states operates within this jungle. Um, I'm not suggesting here that these states are not with no mistakes. No, I'm not saying this. I'm saying that it's um, these states, even when they try to uh, uh, send a reasonable signal or show their willingness to compromise uh, in order to reach a deal or solve a problem, it gets uh, translated in, um, as a sign of weakness by adversaries, which any complicates issue in the region more. We're seeing this currently with this current talks with Iran. Um, having said all this, I do believe that there are um, political buy-ins and, con and uh, in continuing dialogue and not destroying it. Uh, these joint interests, in my view, are present now in a way that did not exist in the past with all these obstacles that we have. And from the Saudis and the Gulf side, um, serious dialogue with Iran, I think is a sincere attempt it will establish the Gulf and, and the Saudis as a constructive regional player. International regional support for the kingdom also security becomes more likely uh, with this shift in approach. I'm always asked if this, if this shift in approach was tactical from the Saudi side. It could be, it could be tactical, but I do not believe so for many good reasons. First of all, the kingdom has massive internal demands, a major restructuring of the economy and new generation demands. The Saudi vision um, 2030 comes to mind. Uh, we have uh, good governance, not only for the Saudis, for all states in the region is a, is a must. It cannot be delayed. But for the Saudis, it's, a, it's an urgent matter more than others because of the size of the economy. This is the biggest economy in the Middle East. 
Um, and also because there is uh, this understanding of the region that the security and of the region lies in, in the hands of the main states of the region. It's not the US or any other external power. So these states need to figure a way, a way to deal with each other first and to defend um, themselves also without external support. Um, it's also better for these states to have a smaller defense budget. If, if such dialogue succeeded, or at least in, in some of its goals, uh, not necessarily all of them, this will, this will help a lot. And without going into much details, and if for the Saudis, it's security and economy, and closing the Yemeni file comes on top of the priorities, and going forward with the diversification with, of the economy, what what, whatever it takes to achieve this, uh, the, the kingdom will engage in. So de-escalation or de-complexion uh, with Iran seems a very logical step in that context. And I also, if I, if I speak about on the behalf of the Iranians, I would say the same goes for Iran. If, mm -hmm. if, if the Mullah regime was rational. Iran has its own strategic plan also called the 20 year national vision of the Islamic Republic, which has social, economic and political goals, uh, elements in, 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 in this plan. And these plans, will not go forward with no stable societies, no vibrant economies, and no stability. So you cannot, you cannot accomplish anything in a hostile region. And despite uh, what we hear from some voices on both sides, actually, and I believe personally that fostering a political climate conductive of exchange is also, um, it's not only a Gulf interest or a Saudi interest, but it's also an Iranian interest because the, this competition is, is costly for everyone especially for the Iranians and for the Iranian people. Additionally, if Iran, as it declares, the Iranians also always declared that they want the US out of the region. The US will not be out of the region without a serious reduction in heat of the region that we have, we have now. Um, and also in case of any kind of deal with the West, uh, whether it's a nuclear deal or, 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 or a more comprehensive deal without going into technical details, it's better and it's very wise to have the Saudis on board or at least neutral, as this will reduce you know, the chances of tearing down any deal in the future and it will, it will make it sustainable for the Iranians. And also um, it's better, it's not, it's not only the Saudis in the region, we have the Turks and we have the Israelis. It's better to Iran to have at least a neutral Saudi in face of its competitors competitors with other powers in the region. So yeah, and are, th these are important actors that even the Turks have currently a good working relation with the Iranians, but they have also their, their issues that they want to solve with the Iranians. So it's better to have the Gulf and the Saudis neutral in this competition. The unfortunate Yemeni crisis could be a good starting point. Yani, uh, uh, allow me to say this. High return, low risk item, geostrategically I'm speaking. Uh, I mean, for both. The kingdom wants to engage, and it's not a secret that the military engagement in Yemen, the Saudis seek to end it as soon as possible. And this area also seek to find an acceptable resolution that will include the main parties and stakeholders in Yemen, including the Houthis. But there should be no, no doubt that there will be, uh, uh, there will be no grand deal in the region or a Saudi rush into a more serious uh, turn and talks with Iran without some sort of compromises from the Iranian side. Iran spends billion in addition to the skeleton of militias it finances in the rest of the region. Uh, and I'm not suggesting here by any means that Iran controls the Houthi or the Houthi would accept whatever the mullahs mandate. No, I'm not suggesting that. What I'm saying is Iran would be able to support a ceasefire in Yemen this will make the Houthis more inclined to engage in a political settlement with other parties in Yemen. In addition, the, and I, I always say this, the weapons that the Houthis are using against the Yemenis first, not the Saudis, are not made in Yemen. They are not made in the caves of Sana'a or Saudi. Uh, they come from outside of Yemen. Yeah. Uh, um, um, can I, I, I'll speak, I mean, but to reach this stage, and yeah, several obstacles confront us. I think um, uh, there is this Iranian belief that solving uh, issues with the West uh, or the US would translate and uh, reflected immediately in their relations with the Saudis. And I think that this is a total fantasy. Uh, this is very problematic. I'm, uh, 
seeing, I mean, seeing Saudi as merely part of the Western bloc because it's uh, basically not true, especially in these times that we live in. Uh, this has been very problematic in the past. I mean, association, um, the association that has resulted in Iran attacking uh, crucial Saudi oil infrastructure, 7 million barrels go through Bgeg, uh, thereby undermining not only the Saudi economic security, but also the global economy. There was no response to this attack. Some people would consider uh, targeting Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis and uh, Qasem Soleimani as a response, but I differ. Also, Iran for decades now used this association between the kingdom and the West and attacking the personal, uh, the political security of Saudi Arabia through targeting the legitimacy of governing Mecca and Medina. Uh, Iran also wants this um, reestablishment of diplomatic relations with, uh, with no compromises. And this would not be acceptable from the Saudis by any means. We also uh, had the problem of lack of assurance and necessary mechanisms associated with this assurance. The two states had some agreement in the past that were totally abandoned by the Iranians. Um, it's uh, it's uh, great doubts from the Saudi sides and the willing, willingness of Iran engaging in real dialogue. The Saudis say that none of the practices of Iran has changed. Iran engaged, they want to talk for the sake of talking. Um, and no one should deny that uh, shift uh, we witnessed in the last few months from this hostile uh, rhetoric to inclusiveness, at least on the rhetorical level from both states is beneficial. Uh, but it wouldn't be sufficient at all. Actions are needed more to move beyond this point. Uh, and deconfliction will certainly take time. Both sides realize that the only way to go is to, to reach a compromise and an agreement. Both parties have good reason in breaking this current pattern of maintaining, maintaining the status quo. Uh, a working and a functional deal is, a much, is much needed. Peace in itself, I think, is necessary and urgent for both. Uh, so in sum, uh, yes, uh, you could please. Uh, I, I will conclude. I will conclude. I will leave the rest for the Q and A. Um, I think Iran, if 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 the if the if the regime was rational, would be better off without internal upheavals caused by economic difficulties. The Gulf is also better off with a, with, a, with a more peaceful Gulf and uh, and improved relations would help everyone. Um, and and ending by a positive no, uh, note, I um, I. Uh, during the past few years, I, I, I was always very optimistic of the, about the future of the escalation in the region, unlike many probably. And I always thought that it was expected and natural, as I said, that states will compete. But both states, I mean, Saudi and Iran, if they want to put an end to their conflicts and that they both can benefit from now, then this is the, the time to do it. I think we have a, a, an open window now and a golden opportunity both states should seize this opportunity if, 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 yani if, uh, if rational thinking was, uh, uh, was followed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hanan. So our next speaker is uh, Nigar Mortazavi. Uh, Nigar is an Iranian American journalist and a political analyst and host of the Iran podcast. Uh, She's based in Washington, D.C. She has been covering Iranian affairs and U.S.-Iran relations for over a decade and a frequent media commentator on Iranian affairs. She has appeared on many media outlets such as CNN, MSNBC, Al Jazeera, um, has interviewed many prominent uh, political, social, and cultural figures, including, interestingly, Muhammad Ali, uh, the boxing champion, and Iranian Foreign Minister uh, Javed Zarif. Uh, Nigar frequently speaks about Iranian affairs at universities and academic in institutions, such as MIT, uh, Princeton, Johns Hopkins. Um, she received many rewards and accolades, including being featured in Forbes magazine among, uh, the, 30, uh, among the 30 most inspirational women. Um, Nigar obtained a master's um, from Brandeis University. Um, she'll be discussing how President Raisi and his government view relations with Riyadh and a deal with Washington. Nigar? Thank you. Thank you so much um, to the Diplomacy Institute and GIF for uh, holding this excellent event, the team that made it happen, and to my 
uh, esteemed panel co-panelists um, for a year, the audience and uh, whoever is tuning in online. So I'll sort of continue on what Ambassador Limbert, uh, who I really look up to, he is one of the few people who understands both countries and sort of this four decade tension very well. Um, on and specifically talk about the JCPOA, the nuclear um, uh, deal, uh, the possibility of the revival of that. And then I'll talk about Iran Saudi talks and elaborate a little more in continuation of what uh, Jean was talking about. So the JCPOA, as it currently stands, um, for those of you who are following closely, the seventh round of talks is going to happen in Vienna. Uh, soon, end of this month, um, there was a what I considered a golden window of opportunity from when President Biden came into office in January until um, the Iranian moderate president went out of office, which was in August, and until Iranian election, really in June, about six to eight months um, for the revival of the JCPOA, and it was one of the promises of the uh, Biden campaign, but that window has been missed. There were, um, the talks started late uh, around April, so about three or so months after the administration came in, and um, the talks have been going on indirectly, so they don't, the Iranian and the US side don't sit at the same table. They're actually at hotels across the street, which really slows the process, and they weren't able to reach a deal while the moderate um, administration was still in office in Tehran. And that includes the moderate president Rouhani and also the Javad Zarif team, the Iranian foreign minister, who were involved in actually making the JCPOA. Um, and on the US side, the team includes very um, a group of diplomats and uh, officials who were also involved in the Obama administration. So that would have been a a really good time to sort of negotiate or settle this return to the JCPOA and it didn't happen. So right now we're at a juncture where there's a new administration in Tehran um, from the hardline camp of Iranian political structure, <clears throat> the president Ibrahim Raisi, a ultra conservative hardliner himself, the foreign policy team that he's setting with a caveat that he's also using some seasoned diplomats who were involved in the JCPOA. But for example, the foreign minister, Hossein Amir Abdullahian, also a hardliner himself. Uh, the prospects for uh, the revival of the JCPOA um, are, it's not clear, but I, I'm cautiously pessimistic when it comes to that. I'm usually an optimist, but in this case, I'm just, I'm, I'm cautiously pessimistic now. I'm pessimistic now. So, um, and that directly connects to talks between Tehran and Riyadh, US Saudi, Iran Saudi relations, um, and whatever happens between Tehran and Washington also will determine Tehran's, um, Iran's foreign policy direction, not only in the region, but also sort of this shift to the East that has already started and is more of the vision of this hardline team looking more towards Russia who's been a strategic ally of Iran and also China for more trade if US sanctions continue, which would be the case of the revival of the JCPOA doesn't happen and a new deal isn't reached. Now, I'm not saying it, it can't happen. There might be a new deal. It could be a different deal. The JCPOA could be revived and that's a whole other conversation for another day, but um, I'm uh, just uh, cautious about that. On Iran-Saudi, uh, talks, as we know, there are currently some engagement, there's some talks happening. There have been five rounds, if I'm not wrong. Um, for a few years, there wasn't uh, really, although I think the Iranian side was interested in reaching out, even under the Rouhani administration, the HOPE initiative, the Hormuz Peace Initiative uh, was something they put out, they were publicly seeking. And I think there was more reluctance maybe on the Saudi side, but um, Hasham is more an expert on that. But I think there seems to be interest on both sides now and these talks are going on and I see some prospect for an opening uh, there. And interestingly, this hardline administration of Ibrahim Raisi, you might not, um, they don't look to the West as the Rouhani team did. 
and that could provide some space for regional opening. The foreign minister himself, uh, Amir Abdullahian, is an expert of the, in the Arab world. He was actually the person responsible for uh, the Arab world in Iranian foreign ministry for many years. He also um, has close ties with the so-called axis of resistance, meaning the various proxies and mil militia groups across the region. Uh, he had good relations with Qasem Soleimani or close ties with Qasem Soleimani before he was assassinated. And uh, he sort of comes from that camp that has been critical of diplomacy and engagement with the West uh, and is also more um, uh, in, con in control of what's going on in their region. So I think that would sort of give him the benefit. Um, and if the AC team empowers him to do to make some um, headway when it comes to talks with Riyadh. It also, of course, it's a two-way street and it depends on uh, how the Saudis want this to, to move forward. But I think with the US uh, sort of disengaging from the region and at least the Middle East becoming less of a priority for this administration and potentially even future US government, I think there's this understanding across the region in different extents, but in Tehran for sure, and in um, some Gulf countries that um, the issues should be resolved regionally and among these rivals and uh, to reduce conflict. I also think the Yemen war, the development of the Yemen war has, has an impact on these calculations. The, uh, Saudis, when it started, they thought that they're going to win this war in a few weeks, and that didn't happen. So I think it's just been a long and uh, really catastrophic process. And um, and also the Jamal uh, Khashoggi killing, I think that had sort of a more of a public opinion impact on the Saudi image across the West. and. Um, it again goes back to how the, the more, the bigger picture of the US disengaging from the region, the Biden administration pulling support for the, uh, for the Saudi forces in the Yemen war and all of that, I think um, are bringing um, factors to the calculation of these regional players. So I see prospects for, for some openings in Iran, Saudi uh, tensions. I hope there are some openings and I think there's some prospects because of the, the combination of these issues that are happening. And I also think the lack of diplomacy would eventually mean more military tension and escalation. And as we were just discussing with Professor Cole, a stumbling even into an unwanted war. I know there's no appetite for an actual war in in the United States. There's also no appetite for a war in Iran between these two countries or even with the major powers across the region. But it's not necessarily something that you want, uh, but something that could potentially happen. So the lack of diplomacy and the resolution of these tensions always means more potential for military tension and escalation. And that's just bad for everyone across the region. Um, so I'll stop there. I'm happy to take questions uh, more about Iran's uh, domestic political shifts and also the JCPOA or um, any other um, questions that are coming up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nigar. Um, and our last speaker, but certainly not least, is uh, Professor uh, David DeRoche. Um, he's currently uh, an associate professor of the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies and a senior non-resident fellow with Gulf International Forum. Prior uh, to this, he was the Defense Department Director responsible for policy concerning Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, the UAE, and Yemen. Um, and prior to this assignment, he has served in the office of the Secretary of Defense as a liaison to the Department of Homeland Security as a senior country director for Pakistan, as NATO operations director, and as deputy director for peacekeeping. He graduated from the United States Military Academy and obtained advanced degrees in air politics from the University of London of Oriental and African Studies 
in, in war studies from King's College London, London and strategic studies from the US Army War College. He also attended the Federal Executive Institute, the German Staff uh, College's Higher Office Seminar, the US Army uh, John F. Kennedy Special Warfare School, <laughs> and the uh, US Army <laughs> General Staff College. Pasta cozy. Pasta. So he's, he's very prepared for this uh, presentation. <laughs> uh, and he will address um, how Biden, um, how President Biden can balance um, U.S. relations with both Riyadh and having a deal in Teh with Tehran. Well, thank you, Danya. It's an honor to be here. I have never set foot outside of Detroit Airport in the state of Michigan before, but my wife is from Ann Arbor and tells me it's the greatest place in the world, and I'm inclined to believe with her. I asked her, what could I say to win over the crowd? She said, talk smack about Ohio State, and for God's sakes, hold in your gut. So... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about some fundamentals of U.S. government, and the perspective I'm going to give you is of a seasoned bureaucrat, uh, which I think I, I have a broad claim to be in. Uh, I actually worked uh, deeply in arms sales, and I will stir up a little bit of controversy here with the group. Um, afterwards, you can ask me difficult probing questions, and as always, if the questions, I will do my best to answer it. If the question is too tough, though, I will start crying. So my first point is uh, talking about when campaign promises uh, collide with the realities of governance. And I think the Biden administration finds itself in one of these. Um, a significant proportion of people who voted for Joe Biden voted to stop the crazy. Uh, it wasn't so much a vote for Biden as it was a vote against Trump. And many of the policies that Donald Trump had reversing them was seen as virtuous in and of itself. The problem is uh, the pledge to re-enter the JCPOA required the acquiescence of the Iranians and they don't have that. It is very rare for a candidate to do a full reversal on a campaign promise uh, once he has exceeded office, although the realities generally are different. The most uh, uh, visible example I can come up with is President John F. Kennedy, who ran uh, citing a missile gap between the United States and Russia, which he blamed the uh, Eisenhower administration for. Once in office, when he was given access to the intelligence, he said, oh, never mind. Um, the additional uh, one that I, I, uh, I think believe every president from Jimmy Carter to Donald Trump ran for office pledging to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. And up until Donald Trump, once they were in office, they said, oh, my gosh, the situation is more complicated than I thought it was. So I don't think Biden is in a position where he can reverse just yet until he fully plays out the JCPOA process. Um, I, I think it's apparent to most people that we're certainly not going to have a productive dialogue, but I think it has to go to the bitter end, both to convince people in his own base, as well as the European allies who really do resent the Trump withdrawal from the agreement. My second point is that the American political argument about the JCPOA really is a theological argument. I don't mean that in the European Union sense where theological means trivial or unimportant. By the way, it's interesting to note when Americans think an argument is trivial or unimportant, we call it academic. But Europeans <laughs> call it theological. That says something about our different countries and what we value. Um, folks who support the JCPOA have the Socrates view of human nature, which is that man wants to do good. And if you give people something good and they see it, they will then seek to build on it. Uh, opponents of the JCPOA have the John Calvin view that man is inherently bad and needs to be scared into this. The thing about a theological argument is it's based on faith. It can't be proven or disproven. So advocates of both the Obama JCPOA and the Trump withdrawal say, we were doing the right thing, we just didn't have enough time to make it stick. We didn't have enough time for the economic benefits of JCPOA to accrue. We didn't have enough time for maximum pressure to force these guys. I would argue that the criteria that these sides have set up, both of them are unmeasurable, unverifiable. Therefore, they are matters of faith, not policy. And it's a theological argument. My third point, is what makes this a theological argument is the paradox of sanctions. Sanctions, um, and, and this is in part us projecting our own system on others. In a corrupt authoritarian state, which is what Iran is, uh, as Ambassador Lumber has told you, uh, in a corrupt authoritarian states, the paradox of sanctions is that they give the corrupt authoritarian leadership a larger piece of a shrinking pie. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, relief of sanctions will take a long time to benefit people because 
Who's going to invest their own money in a country like in a, in a cement plant in Iran when the Revolutionary Guard can seize it, put you out of business, and maybe put you in jail? The only investment we saw were state guaranteed things Peugeot, Airbus, Boeing. Paradoxically, if you increase sanctions under max pressure, the people who actually control the state don't care because they get more control over the state assets. They're able to you know, acquire illicit commissions from skimming illicit oil sex, uh, sessions, things like that. My fourth point which just came out this afternoon, the Iranian official newspaper listed eight um, conditions for the resumption of the JCPOA. All eight of these conditions are unmeetable by any American politician who ever hopes for him or his party to hold power. One of them, for example, calls for the payment of reparations. Um, the Shah's money, which was held in escrow from the revolution, that has been returned to Iran. So if there are to be any more payments, it will be from the US taxpayer. That's a non-starter. That's a non-starter. Um, so uh, I think that's not going to happen. My fifth point is, and we have to agree that there is a visceral dislike between the United States and Iran, visceral, not cerebral, which is hard to quantify. Consider, we lost 58,000 soldiers in Vietnam, 58,000, okay? The current U.S. Army dress shirt that you see Mark Milley wearing, the brown shirt that goes under the jacket at the press conference, that is made in Vietnam. I deployed to Afghanistan with a pistol holster that was made in Vietnam. That was issued to me by the US Army. We have had nowhere near that death toll at the hands of the Iranians, but because they're seen as, I don't know, perfidious or less honorable, in large part because of this taking of hostages, which is seen as dishonest and underhanded, there is a much greater degree of enmity. It will take much longer for us to have this visceral reconciliation that we've had with Vietnam, where we lost 58 thousand people. So that's that. Now, let me take disagreement with uh, Ambassador Limbert, who is the kindest, bravest, warmest, most wonderful human being I've ever met in my life. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> and if, <laughs> and if you get that. that reference, you're old enough. You're old enough. Um, uh, first off, I would say that it is a fundamental mistake to project American policy from the pre-Cold War or the Cold War period into the post-Cold War period. The calculus and the decisions were driven by completely different factors. And if you try to do that, I think that you are, you are taking a very, very grave risk. And so I would disagree with you. We have to fight to keep people awake. I realize that people have left the room. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, the second point <laughs> is, and here I, I assert just as my uh, experience, uh, I was actually the spokesman for the agency that sells weapons. Um, in the modern era, we do not push weapons on partners. The demand signal is greater. We actually deny far more than we sell. For example, uh, we have never sold these following capabilities to Saudi Arabia, electronic warfare, surface to surface missiles, dro armed drones, uh, dedicated bombers or naval mines. Recall when the Abraham Accords were announced, the press release was that the United Arab Emirates was going to buy electronic warfare aircraft, the Joint Strike Fighter, which they had been asking for for years. Uh, and um, what was the third one? Armed drones. That was in the Trump administration. When the final notice of sale was made, the electronic warfare aircraft were not included. So folks asked for more than one. I realized that that's controversial. And I realized that if you study at a modern American university, the idea that economic determinism is not the be all end all is contrary to everything you've learned in a Western university. However, I, I will be willing to engage with that on questions with that. Thank you. Thank you. So now um, we'll proceed to the Q&A uh, session. Um, please feel free uh, to raise your hand and pose a question. Um, uh, yes, sorry, I don't know your name. So. That's all right, I'm Juan Paul. I teach history here at the University of Michigan. Hi, John. Hello, uh, uh, I, I have a question, uh, which is a genuine question in the sense that I don't know the answer and I don't have enough data to answer it. but. Um, uh, it seems to me that uh, it's possible that the Asian uh, rising powers may have something to say about Saudi Arabia and Iran, and maybe saying it behind the scenes because they don't, they're not as public as the diplomacy. But I just wonder, you know, China has picked up Iran as a project, and uh, Iran, Iran has been pushed into China's arms by, by the U.S. Uh, actions. Uh, and uh, and Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Iran are all closer and closer to Delhi every day. 
uh, and, uh, and and then Saudi Arabia is the largest source of petroleum for, for China. So behind the scenes, uh, when the Americans aren't around, are, are, uh, are the diplomats from the Modi government and the Xi government pressing Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, to cut it out uh, and make sure that the oil flows to uh, India and China without interruption. Uh, they must have been really nervous about FK. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, um, I wonder if any of the uh, panelists have some insight into this. Who would like to respond? Dave? Yeah. Um, thank you. That's a great question. So um, we generally think that in the United States is chaotic haphazard and our adversaries have this master plan that they're executing with mathematical precision. But I think that, you know, that's not human nature. Everybody else, you know, when you're inside the factory seeing the sausage being made, it's ugly and bloody. So the, um, uh, there is a, a powerful paradox in American talk towards Russia, or I'm sorry, towards China. China, as you said, they get all their energy, they get a lot of their um, trade with the Gulf. Who guarantees the stability of that trade? It's the United States. Do they want to pay for it? No, I think they view us as suckers because uh, you know we get almost no, no oil from that. So China wants to see our standing diminished. Uh, they want to see us take it you know, in the shorts, but they don't want to see things you know, diminish to such a thing that there's war. So that's their challenge. Now, here's a paradox in American thinking. Occasionally, President Trump said this a few times, he referred to China as being free riders on uh, the security and stability that America provides in the Gulf. And I've seen this problem as well um, with another country where we were doing a UN peacekeeping mission. We're saying, well, China, you know, benefits from the American presence. Okay, so what if China said, okay, we've got three aircraft carriers as a, you know, next year we'll have three aircraft carriers. We're gonna have one permanently based in the Gulf. Everybody in the United States government would have a heart attack at that. So we haven't quite ad admitted to that. So, but I, I think they're trying to walk a fine line. They want to see our influence diminish. They want to uh, win the ideological war, which is technology enhanced authoritarianism uh, as an opposite to this, what they portray as messy, chaotic democracy, which will just allow the dissidents in your uh, country to overwhelm your rule. Uh, but I don't think they want a military confrontation. And I would note that uh, a lot of offensive capabilities China has not sold. You know, the, the Iranian missile arsenal is domestically produced. It's not sold. I would uh, You want to say something? A, a brief comment to, okay, go ahead. to the question. I think this is an important question as China is riding freely, or at least in the past, but not now. With, this, with these holes in the US and security and in the region, at a certain point, they would step in. They should step in. Um, currently, the sanction in Iran could be beneficial for both the Russians and the Chinese. Um, but the Chinese, until now, they did not, we're not seeing any pressure. No. They, uh, they try to, uh, the, the whole thing seems irrelevant to them now, but not later on. Things I think will change and will change radically in the near future. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, I'm Mark Bessler. I teach political science here at Middle East Politics. Uh, I wonder if we can add Israel to the equation, uh, its relations with the, uh, with, the, with the monarchies is obviously changing. Um, I think there is a good chance there's going to be some sort of a conflict between the US and Israel over its Iranian policy. Uh, so on a number of different levels, uh, Israel may, may have some influence. And so I wonder if that, uh, what that adds to the uh, discussion we've been having. Uh, go ahead, Nagar. Um, thank you for the question. I, I agree with you. I think, Bill, uh, when it comes to dealing with Iran, the Biden administration is trying to sort of forge a different path compared to Obama, the sort of public pushback that the Obama administration got back then from Bibi Netanyahu speaking against uh, negotiations at US Congress and very publicly pushing back. I think try, trying to avoid some of that by having more direct um, connections. There's the, the, uh, an actual task force or um, 
I'm blanking on the name, but established so they can have direct back and forth. So there are no surprises uh, in the form of sabotage from the Israelis towards Iran, um, or at least that the, if it happens, it's not a surprise. Um, and that they sort of coordinate. I, I'm not sure if uh, Israel would be happy, the current government, in any form of a deal with Iran, even though we saw back then during the JCPOA, and this is not usually making it to the headlines, that the Israeli security and intelligence apparatus sort of concluded that the JCPOA was in their security benefit because it put a lid on Iran's nuclear program, and pulling out of the JCPOA just took the nuclear prog uh, program to a different, led the nuclear program to be uh, developed to a different level. So um, it's I think it's a it's an important factor in the whole equation, and when it comes to also um, the dealings of other countries or rivals in the region, I think U.S. disengagement um, from the region is something that both Israel and also in Tehran, uh, their rivals are taking into account for um, Iran engaging with the Saudis and uh, some of these other neighboring countries. May, may, may I comment? Of course. Briefly, thank you for your thank you for your question. I, I, you know, quite dealing with questions like that, I I have to put on my so-called Iran expert hat. And what I've discovered is, if you're going to call yourself an Iran expert, it's actually very simple. Um, you ask, you answer your, the, every question. You can either say I don't know, or it's very complicated. <laughs> And that covers that covers just about everything. That covers just about everything. Um, but this is this is uh, actually quite interesting. When I worked, when I uh, came out of retirement in 2009, 2010, and worked back in the administration on um, Iranian affairs, um, it was very difficult. It was incredibly hard to sort of get either side off the dime when we started these nuclear negotiations early in the Obama administration, early in the Obama administration, the Obama administration had said it was going to re it wanted to reach out. I mean, they'd made, they'd made offers. Uh, but one problem, I mean, there were a lot of problems on the Iranian side, but on the, um, on the, on our side, one of the, one of the problems was the, the personality. I mean, they say in, in, in politics, you should separate the person from the problem, but we couldn't separate the personality of, Apani, of President Ahmadinejad from what was going on. And his comments about, particularly about um, Holocaust, about the Holocaust and his Holocaust denial comments, his comments about Israel, about Israel had made him toxic um, in Washington. And it didn't matter what he said, you know, he might say something nonsense or it might be sensible, no one was listening to it. And that really got us stuck. Uh, that really got us stuck uh, on that. The Iranians on, from their side, of course, um, um, had their own problems. Um, I had an Israeli friend uh, tell me something and I, I didn't believe him at first. Um, he said that, um, he said that the, the um, Israeli, opposition, a lot of the opposition to uh, uh, the hostility toward Iran um, was not about Iran. It was hostility, it was about Obama. And it was a kind of cooperation between the Israeli right and the American right, the target of which was not Iran, but was the Obama administration. And I so they had the shared enemy. They had the shared enmi uh, shared enmity. Um, I thought, oh, that's no, nah, that's too conspiratorial. Not true. And then I thought about it and looked at some of the things that went on, and I think maybe there was something there. Maybe there was something there. Maybe, maybe that's the theory. That's that's worth looking at. Okay, Hisham, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just, I think, I think the Israeli factor is an important factor, but very uh, briefly, two two main points. First normalization between some of the Gulf states and um, Arab Gulf states and Israel, I think is a reaction to the perception of the withdrawal from the US to region more than a response to uh, Iran. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing, I, I don't think it's uh, one size fits all. It's case specific and country specific. So you cannot just, um, so for a certain Gulf country, what works for uh, this state would not work for uh, a state with a larger size geostrategically and uh, 
and more weight economically. I think it's a, it's not the same equation. Uh, different states would would probably have different paths and tracks when when it comes to normalization with these right, especially if this comes with no benefits. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. I saw a few hands. If you could raise it again, because I don't. I just look into the future a little bit. It appears, and I could be wrong, that oil will not be as important in 20 years. I really hope we move away from that. And it does take away, and I, I understand the Saudi uh, government wants to somewhat move away from oil as a main portion of their. And maybe that's an, also a, a reason they're normalizing with Israel a little bit, seeing the way Israel has developed as a non-oil state. Mm. The ones that really have a lot to lose in not moving forward are the Iranians. It seems like most of their income is derived from oil. Even the move to the east towards China is oil related to provide energy. And if, if we move away from that, if, if, if the world does, what does Iran have left? And it would seem uh, intuitive to me for them to, to try to become a, a member of, of the broader international community uh, with the United States and develop economically outside of oil. It, for them to, to come to an agreement, and I'll uh, ask an opinion on that. I agree with you, but you know, there's different camps and different schools of thoughts in Tehran. And as I said, the, that's why I talked about that window of opportunity. The moderates in the Iranian political structure think like that. They were, they were shifting to the West, looking to the West, engagement with the West, with the US, which was historic. The JCPOA and negotiations were historic. Some thought it was a miracle. Never, nobody expected it to happen in some extent. Um, but the hardliners don't think like that. And the direct result or one of the direct results of the maximum pressure policy of the US pulling out of a deal which had signed that Iran was complying to in full compliance when the Trump administration left was the empowering of the hardline faction in Iran. So it really weakened and marginalized the moderates. It, the hardliners took over the Iranian parliament the year before, then they took over the presidency. And meanwhile, in the meanwhile, there's also, of course, repression happening in the country. The civil society is really shrinked um, as, a, as a direct result also of the weakening of the economy in, in the shadow of sanctions. COVID is a, is a factor. Iran is the epicenter of the pandemic in the Middle East. It's just these, these, these things are really hurting the economy, but that's just not the thinking mm -hmm. of part of the political structure that you, know, you just take however the U.S. Uh, gives it to you. And, well, you know, I'm at the sorry. end. Just to, if the United States would, you, know, you talked about the Shah, the other gentleman in the, in the middle for a moment. The U.S. really hasn't taken full responsibility. You said they paid, they, they, they paid back some of the money that the Shah had taken. I think that's no, no. What they did was they there was money that the Shah had given for purchase of U.S. weapons that were held in escrow. And then when the revolution came, those funds were held in escrow and accrued interest. Those were the pallets of cash that were given to the Iranian regime um, after the conclusion of the JCPOA. Do, do the Iranians still have a deep mistrust of the United States? Because oh, hell yeah. Yes. Yeah, so oh, hell yeah. I was, uh, yeah. How could, how could the United States take more responsibility <laughs> for that time period? It doesn't seem like... We have. I mean, it was extremely repressive. I'm sorry. No, so as just pushing back on what David was saying, there's a long list of grievances, and I want to pass it on to John right after I finish. There's a long list of grievances on both sides. And I think the problem with this US Iran four decade tensions is that each side only sees or projects the conflict from their viewpoint. They just air their own grievances, which are many on both sides. but without looking to the other side or putting themselves in the shoes of the other and how they see this conflict. There's definitely a deep feeling of mistrust. Obviously, Iran sees itself as the underdog in the region. Part of Iran's regional policy is shaped because Iran sees itself as the underdog in this power projection from a superpower, which is the US. But um, you know, unless unless the the list, and we don't have to go item by item on the list, but for every grievance the US brings up, the Iranians have something on their own side. And unless this conflict is seen as a two-sided thing, yeah. um, I just don't, yeah. don't see that, it that's being That's not a resolved. pushback, that's a concurrence. I'll tell you, every day between the United States and Iran is Festivus. 
and it starts with the airing of grievances and then you have the feats of strength every day is festivus on both sides yeah yeah uh, you know it's interesting what you what you mentioned about oil no, got me fat future. got me sort of thinking and you know what you have is the possibility yeah. if you think about it you could have a loosening of the so-called oil curse mm -hmm. what's well, going to happen either way and that and you know that has been a particular disaster in this region because it's enabled the governments in the region to maintain authoritarian and corrupt systems immune from pub world public opinion or outside pressure uh, outside pressure if their oil if, if their oil is not doesn't have the same demand you know then maybe that there's a relief on the horizon from that particular curse it would seem that's why an agreement between the two the Saudis and the Iranians even more on this yes. I, I, I let others speak okay uh yeah. Hisham? Well, as someone from the region, I would I would really like to disagree with you, but unfortunately, I cannot. Uh, this is um, <laughs> <laughs> this is an ex existential threat more than the religious wars between these states. So the diminishing of yes, yes, oil. yeah, and, it, and states in the region. Uh, and uh, allow me to disagree also with John when he says, um, actually, if there was no oil in the region, there would be no states. Um, but states in the region now, I think oil was beneficial to the region mm -hmm. with all with its uh, disadvantages, mm -hmm. but it was an, uh, a blessing. And the only way to move forward is to try to break this rentier model in a sure. very gradual way. This is my opinion. And states in the region now, it seems that they're realizing that um, global warming and climate change is not a joke. Some of the states there uh, uh, thought that it was a joke. But now with the reduction of the carbon footprint uh, in less than 10 years, and someone could correct me in the statistics, these states would lose at least 50% of their income. So this is not something light or should be taken lightly. It's, uh, it's more impo important than who's, who should be the Khalif, uh, Omar or Ali, for instance, the Sunni Shia uh, uh, theological battle. Uh, so this is a serious challenge and could open an opportunity for all states in the region. That's why I'm saying the only initiatives that you see now, and you could, I mean, you could go hard on the Gulf states as much as you can, but the only initiatives that you see in the region is in the Gulf states. Whether it's from the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Qataris, the Bahrainis, you're seeing at least attempts uh, in trying to diverse, diversify their economy and also um, some sort of green initiatives. But you're not seeing this uh, any elsewhere in the region. If I could add uh, to that, um, I think the GCC states are also trying to bring their, with regards to oil, um, kind of be on the forefront of this kind of climate change issue and make the argument that oil in the Gulf is less damaging to the environment and cheaper than oil in other true. places. The, so that's one of the primary arguments being placed. And then there is also the other hydrogen development that's kind of a new development in which they're trying to, and I, I'm not a tech person, but they're trying to develop hydrogen and they say it's less costly for the environment and they're moving forward with this initiative as well. So I don't think that, that they're trying to move away from, from, from hydrocarb, hydrocarbons, but they are, they are trying to kind of uh, make the point that their 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 uh, fossil fuels and whatnot are more environmentally friendly than other places in the world. Um, that's one. In reference to the rentier model, um, uh, uh, I would have to say that of course the equation is changing, and they, the 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 model has actually shifted. There's been a decrease in in rentierism in the Gulf states, and I do think that. The rentier argument is is kind of diminishing um, as we're moving along to a certain degree. In different Gulf states, is different. For for example, in Bahrain, uh, I think it would be different. I mean, there's a sense of rentierism for other GCC states um, supporting the country. That's a different form of rentierism, I guess. But um, in Saudi Arabia, uh, it's definitely shifting. In Qatar and Kuwait, no rentierism is 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 very strong. Um, so I think. Um, Nuance is really important. Um, 
And then the argument about authoritarianism and oil, um, I think that is very debatable. I mean, if you look across the Middle East, authoritarianism is doing quite well and many countries don't have oil. Um, and these are tribal societies. So there's a different way of thinking about authority than, than Western societies. I, I, I will not go, I will not engage in these debates. Okay, we, okay. Could, we could go for hours, but quickly, last point on this. Is it beneficial for the Iranians? Yes. This is the only way to go forward. And you compare the, compare the misery that we have now, the failed states, what could be done with better relations with, with Riyadh. This would, yeah, instead of this external huge burden financial in Iran, because this, I mean, the skeleton of militias cost Iran billions in the region. Uh, and, uh, and the Iranian people are paying for keeping this uh, skeleton active. Uh, and it's not only if you if you open the doors with Riyadh, it doesn't open it doesn't open only the Saudi economy for Iran, which is the largest economy. In the no, it gives the signal to the rest of the region, especially the other Gulf states, that Riyadh is heading into this direction, so we can all be open to Iran. And this would open this would open the, the economies of the Gulf, all of them, with no exceptions, uh, to Iran. So the, the benefits is, are enormous for the Iranians, especially. Okay, so maybe we move on to the next question. That's okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Will. I'm sorry. Will. Will. Okay, you know his name. Will. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Will. I'm a junior at the Ford School um, for the Policy Program. Um, so I have two questions, if you don't mind. But I guess the most important question is um, the role in Turkey has to play in the Middle East. Um, Recently, you know, Turkey has got has used mercenaries um, from the province of Syria, um, SNA, to deploy them in different proxy wars like Libya um, on behalf of the GNA or in Nagorno Karabakh and Armenia, and also against Ar Armenia and with the Assyrian forces. Um, where do you think the um, Turkish geopolitical um, uh, interests align with that of the GCC, or whether and how do you think the um, it will impact Saudi and Iranian um, great power politics? Um, my second question was on um, the role of the United Arab Emirates in the Yemeni civil war um, and the role in which the Southern Transitional Council has to play um, independent of the GCC coalition um, in support of the Yemeni government against, against the GCC. Who would like to take a step? I'll do both. Okay. Um, <laughs> I worked at Turkey Desk as an intern in the Office of Secretary of Defense in 1984. And back then there were very, I was the only intern in the Pentagon and the West Point uniform was white shirt, light gray. People would always address me in French because I thought I was the French era attache. In those days, prior to the rise of Erdogan, whenever there was a meeting about Turkey, the general tone was, how can we help out the Turks? What can we do to do this? These guys have so many challenges. We need to support the Turks. And there was a lot of innovative thinking. For example, there was body armor that, um, this was prior to the establishment of strong exports. Qaddafi had bought body armor and we realized, oh my God, yeah, we can't give him this body armor, but an export license had been granted. So the US government bought the body armor and we gave it to the Turkish national police, uh, stuff like that. Nobody's being innovative, finding a way to do Turkey, you know, Erdogan's Turkey favors like that. The country has changed fundamentally. Uh, the mercenaries is one of the least attractive assets of that. But, you know, Turkey, I think, it sees uh, using Idlib mercenaries as a twofer because they eliminate a potential threat to their southern borders and they're able to project power relatively cheaply. Um, and that's just kind of the new the new age of warfare, we've seen Russian uh, use of mercenaries, we've seen Iranian use of mercenaries, and now we're seeing Turkish use of mercenaries. But I think regardless, even with the changed complexion of Turkey under Erdogan, the protection of Turkish sovereignty is a civil religion. And uh, the protecting the Turkish southern border from incursions, uh, I think that there is a broad concurrence within Turkish, the Turkish body politic and the importance of that. So I think everything else is an added benefit. That's the prime driver. The second question is the role of the UAE in the Yemen civil war and the STC. I, I don't know a whole lot about this, but I know something about it. And it appears that, um, uh, and, and if, if you go on the C-SPAN website, the day after the war in Yemen started, I, I'm, I'm on there and I basically said, look, you know, they're going from the air. If they don't achieve all their goals within three weeks, they probably never will. Um, so that was in 2015. Um, as the war dragged on, it appeared that the uh, each country, the, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, 
um, diverged in their aim of what was achievable and what was beneficial. It appears to me, I, I do believe that if they thought it was achievable with the military means they were willing to bring to bear to have a unified Yemen that was friendly to the GCC, that's what they would have done. But I think there was a tactical, actually an operational decision made uh, by the UAE that those goals were not achievable. And so in effect, they, they sort of diverged from their Saudi um, partners and accepted half a loaf under terms that were best for them. I don't think that was their war aim at the start. I think that that was something that they settled on as the war dragged on and it proved to be uh, you know, unachievable with the military means they were going to build to bear. So I think to a certain extent, they kind of called an audible at the line of scrimmage, but there are a lot of people who write more and better on this than me. Okay, would anybody else like to make any last points? Um, yes, Scott. Um, since we did not speak a lot about Yemen, I think that uh, the misery in Yemen uh, resembles what happened in, uh, in Syria. I'm not, I'm not taking the blame from anyone and placing it on Iran. Point of view, the, the interventions in the region, the way the, is a major part of the problem we have. I mean, um, it's not only Yemen, it's Iraq, it's Syria, it's we see now with the failed state in Lebanon. Um, the, it seems that the, this modus of uh, operandi that Iran operates in, is diff, it's not a national, nation state uh, uh, approach. It's, um, it's an Ummah approach. They see interventions as acceptable in any place in the region. And it's, uh, yeah, at least and the Saudis in their public announcements are saying that all parties, including the Houthis, should engage in a political process. But this is not happening because of this intervention. And no one should expect that um, this escalation and violence would stop without some sort of, uh, of, uh, of compromises from all sides. But we're not <coughs> pressuring the Saudis. And I, I, I do understand that, you, okay, you pressure one side, but ignoring the other side would, would not bring the war into uh, an end. And, uh, and I have, I have to comment on, on, on this confidence building measures, if you allow me, uh, a, a quick comment. Okay, so, yeah. so start, uh, just one second. You, you can, everyone after this has one minute to say their closing remarks. It will start with Hisham for his closing remarks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I still, I remain optimistic. I think that stopping the exchange of accusations is good between the states and uh, people to people relations, we're seeing this improving, uh, we're seeing, um, uh, the economies are opening between states, some states and Iran. These are all fine. And, and, and talking to each other, that, then you know, talking uh, talking to each other directly is also good. And uh, and, and transform it, transforming the conflict um, resolution uh, rather than uh, trying to uh, thinking that a magical solution would happen between states is is something also uh, useful. But this dialogue and confidence building measures will not be enough to ease tensions and resolve conflicts. I think this is a total fantasy. What would resolve conflicts is that we see a reduction in aggression capabilities in the region. We see less intervention. We see some compromises from all sides. This is the only way that this region could survive and we could see hope because the current situation now, if you look at the, the fertile crescent, you see all these failed states, you see all this misery, and again, to the point that Iran, if Iran um, thinks rationally, they would, they would see that this is very costly, financially, at least, and a solution needs to be uh, reached as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hisham. Nigar? Um, I just wanted to... Um reiterate that Iran's regional policy and the part of the rivalry and the tensions and the proxies, the axis of resistance, as it's called, is uh, sort of, from Tehran's viewpoint, a response to um, the US, this great power uh, presence across the region, which Iran obviously in a direct war can't win against. So they have these set up these uh, networks or alliances across the region. And Iran is not the only party who's intervening in the region, the Saudis, the UAE, the Emiratis, and of course the biggest intervention uh, across the region of the United States. So I think US, 
disengaging from the region in the long term would mean hopefully more cooperation and more resolution of the conflicts among the parties and the neighbors without this sort of thumb on the scale when it comes to um, the different conflicts. And obviously Tehran, Washington resolving their political issues diplomatically would also have great impact on how the region moves forward and what the continuation or the reduction of, of these tensions um, also depends a lot on what happens in the nuclear negotiations. Thank you, Nagar. Dave? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm guardedly optimistic that uh, there will be a rapprochement during the four years, uh, some sort of diplomatic arrangement. I don't think it will be the JCPOA. I think the JCPOA is going to have to die in a way that uh, demonstrates particularly the European partners that the United States did everything they could to try to revive it. And then I think we'll move on to something else. I think the greater threat to the region is not nuclear weapons, but rather the Iranian missile arsenal, which um, is much harder to police. And I think that if we start to see a proliferation of missiles in the region, which is possible, um, I, I think that uh, then perhaps uh, this will come to. And then the second question, this is an analytical question. Has Iran reached the natural limit of its expansion? The proxy warfare strategy is really only effective in countries that have a large Shia uh, population and have a really dysfunctional government. Well, they pretty much reached all of those. So, um, you know, uh, Bahrain is not going to go over to the side. So I think we may be at the limits of, of Iranian power. And when a country like that, a revolutionary country, stops expanding, uh, generally it tends to look in at itself. So um, there is, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic than I think people would, would uh, expect me to be there. Thank you, Ambassador Lindbergh. I, I just wanted to thank and recognize Professor, Professor Cole for his great work in this field. And he's really, you know, read his material, read his material, read his things, listen to him. He was also, I think if I'm not wrong, you were my daughter's professor here. Uh, I was. Many, I was, a few years. A few years ago <laughs> here, in Michigan, here in Michigan. Uh, no, just, um, I'm glad that um, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dave here pointed out uh, this persistence of grievances and the, the paradoxes involved, you know, why, Given the history, why why have we remained enemies for so long? When look at what with Vietnam and after eventually with the Soviet Union, eventually with, even with Cuba, with China, um, and as I said, I don't have I, I don't have the answer. But this uh, persistence of grievances is 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 very tough, and we we've got to get beyond it. I'll just end with a very quick story. Uh, shortly after I left government service, um, I was invited to lunch. Um, at, uh, at an Iranian diplomat's uh, uh, residence in New, in New York City, part of the UN, he was part of the UN delegation. And of course, uh, very nice lunch, but um, at, the, I was treated to a recitation of grievances. And he said, you know, you know, the trouble is the United States did this and the United States did that and the United States did something else. And I said to him, sir, um, if I were still with the government, which I am not, I would need to refute you point by point. But I'm not with the government. So I will say only this. This um, exchange of grievances, what the Iranians call gelegozori, this exchange, you know, where they, I said, this is, I, I see no point in it. Um, it's like an old, it's like a, a couple stuck in a bad marriage. Um, all they do is just keep beating on each other and bring up old old grievances. And yeah. what's the point of it? Uh, we ought to be able to get beyond that. And he looked at me and he said, you know, you're right. He said, "There, you're right. There, there's not much point in it. Uh, but tell me one thing. He said, why did the United States do this? And why did the United States do that? <laughs> <laughs> My point is, folks, this is going to be hard. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is going to be hard. It's going to take time. It's going to take patience. It's going to take for, forbearance. Yeah, yeah. And there are going to be a lot of, a lot of setbacks. But, uh, you know, I, I think your presence here tonight is good testimony. Sure. People are interested in these things. People are curious about these things. So I certainly... Um, uh, thank you and praise you for that. Excellent. Um, well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for a very timely and important issue.
and one that we could probably revisit on many, many more panels. I've had many Iran panels and GCC panels so far. Um, and thank you for co-sponsoring this event with us and um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks. Did you